Hello everybody, uh, welcome to The Atheist Experience. I am your host, Russell Glasser, and with me today, joining us for the first time, is Ryan Bell. Thank you, thanks for having me. Hey. <laughs> you may recognize Ryan Bell from such blogs as Year Without God. Uh, today is Sunday, March 8, 2015. We are a live call-in public access atheist television show <clears throat> based in Austin, Texas dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We are available through live streaming at ustream.tv. The official Atheist Experience website is www.atheist-experience.com and you can provide feedback by commenting on the official show blog, freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP, or you can email tv at atheist-community.org. If you enjoy the show today, please check out our related podcast, The Nonprofits, which is currently airing on the first and third Wednesday of the month, uh, live at the ACA building where we just had a pizza party. There won't be any pizza left at the next show, but come on down anyway um, in a couple weeks. And as always, the cast and crew of The Atheist Experience, and presumably Ryan, are going to be going to dinner at <coughs> El Arroyo at 1624 West 5th Street, arriving at around 6 p.m. So, here welcome we to Austin. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we saw you do a lecture today. Uh, you, for people who might not have heard that lecture or heard of you before, uh, what's going on with you? Well, I... <laughs> Probably a lot of people have heard I've uh, been doing this Year Without God uh, blog and experience during 2014. And uh, back at the beginning of 2014, I had come to a place in my life where I was uh, sort of at the end of my rope when it comes to um, religion and my faith. I had been a pastor for about 20 years. And I just uh, decided I was going to take the next year of my life and really explore um, what atheism looks like, what the arguments are, what people who are atheists give as reasons why they've become atheists, and just explore that as a possible answer to the many questions that I had accumulated over 20 years of ministry and probably 40 years of being a Christian. So uh, in January of this, this year, I, uh, I decided that I was an atheist. And... Um, and All right. uh, yeah, yeah, it's one of those big decisions in life, I guess. Um, and so now I've been in, in uh, San Antonio yesterday and Austin today uh, talking to a couple of different groups and uh, meeting new people and sharing my story. So, so um, when you started this Year Without God thing, uh, I guess a lot of people who had heard about you were a little suspicious <laughs> about whether you were just going to use it as, as like a, a way to showboat and go back and say, oh, I checked out atheism. All atheism has to offer and uh, definitely come back to Jesus. Yeah. Um, what were you thinking at the beginning? What I was, I guess what I was thinking was that I had this um, personal crisis in my own life and I needed a way to process through that. And so I, I was leaning atheist. I was leaning um, towards this idea that there isn't a God. I mean, it was the one thing that I hadn't really spent any time focused on in terms of how to make sense of the experiences that I had and the inconsistencies and um, the challenges that I had trying to fit uh, my lived experience of the world into a uh, biblical Christian worldview. And I had been working at that theologically for a long time and uh, had resigned from my ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Church about nine months prior. 
And uh, that gave me the space and the freedom and the mental sort of space to think about a different way of thinking about the world. And, uh, and so I was leaning atheist, but I really started that year hoping that I would figure out a way to believe in God. I mean, that was my background. That was my whole history. That was everything I had given my professional and academic life to. And uh, so the idea of starting over with a whole new way of looking at the world wasn't super attractive to me, but I did want to find the truth. I wanted to know the truth. And um, so that's kind of, kind of how I started the year. I hadn't done any research really preparing me for that year. I hadn't Googled all the atheist groups I could find to figure out what was going on. I really just ignorantly sort of stumbled into, I wonder if there are atheists out there talking about atheism. Let's go find <laughs> out. So um, that was did you actually have a hard time? Like, or, or I mean, you say that you weren't sure if you would find any atheists out there. Like, was this a surprise coming from your Seventh Day Adventist background that there were actually were groups of atheists who were talking to each other? A little bit. I mean, I, I expected that there would be um, atheists. Uh, I thought that there would be um, obviously people who didn't believe in God. I had experienced people in my own life that didn't believe in God, but I, I didn't as much have the sense that there were gatherings or conventions or organized groups. I, I was more familiar with the separation of church and state groups, um, and uh, the Adventist church actually is heavily invested in the separation of church and state, so that was familiar to me, but I wasn't as aware at, really at all that there were organized groups of free thinkers, skeptics, atheists that were meeting on a regular basis to kind of discuss how to advance this, these ideas. Hmm. So it was a little bit new to me. Cool. Um, well, I had some other questions, but I feel like our first caller is actually going to ask some of them for <clears> me. <throat> so if you don't mind, I'm going to cut straight to uh, Philip in Chicago. And uh, hey, Philip, how are you today? Whoop. Oh, line one. I forgot the phone's busted again. <laughs> Philip? Hey, how's it going? Hi, how are you? Hi. Doing real good. Hey, Pastor, how you doing? Doing well. What? That's good. Oh, yeah. Uh, turn. If you've still got your TV or uh, stream on, then turn it off because you're getting some echo. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. What's on your mind? Okay, my my, my question is to do with the title. We got the atheist experience, and mm -hmm. I, I see. Uh, basically, my question has to do with has atheist experienced something bad on the topic of the Bible theologically in order to reside with their label. So uh, there are two of us here today, and actually I am a lifelong atheist, so my answer is real short and sweet, no. Uh, I'm going to kick this over to Ryan to see what, what he thinks. <laughs> are, are you asking whether or not atheists have had a bad experience with Christianity and that's why they're atheists? Right. Allow me to identify myself. I'm basically, I think I'm an atheist. I actually think I'm a, a, an original atheist before the separation of church and state. This atheist word it did not even get to. There's, there's one that made it into the dictionary, and then there's the one before the Romans and the, that whole fall went that the atheists that oh, just believed. You mean Christians were in, referred to as atheists oh, because they didn't believe in Roman gods. Roman gods. Is that what you're saying? They did. They they only believed in nature, full nature, beyond cosmos. Uh, sure, but uh, you're a Christian, right? That's what people call me. Okay, fair enough. Well, do you believe? So what's, in, yeah. Okay. What's the question? Or uh, well, his question, I think. Uh, he was asking in general, but did you in particular have a like especially bad experience with Christian with religion that turned you away from the whole thing? I mean, I think anybody that has spends any time around religious people um, has bad experiences. I mean, I think if you're mm -hmm. 
a member of a political party and you spend time with the members of your party, you'll probably have some bad experiences too. Um, but in general, right. I had a great experience in the church. My childhood growing up in the church was really positive. Uh, you know, summer camp, youth group, um, just good conversation about issues that I cared about. And so I would say, um, even as a pastor, I mean, it's, it's hard work being a pastor. You're exposed to sort of the ugly underbelly of the church in a way, like the, the politics of it. Um, but in general, oh. I, I really loved being a pastor. I had a, I had a really good experience. So you're still a pastor, just what? in a different label. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it feels that way. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes I'm asked to uh, answer questions or share my experience with others or listen to others as they share their experience with me in a way that is mm -hmm. somewhat pastoral or, or like a chaplain in a way. Uh, so, so right. yeah, I mean... I'm not sure where you're headed with the label, but it, it sometimes feels appropriate. Yes, I, I have a theory that uh, everybody that dislikes something, uh, they had an experience that took them elsewhere, and it well, always had to do with people. You're, I, I mean, if you're going to try to apply this universally to all atheists, you should take into account my experience, which is my parents were also atheists. I never really grew up believing in God, uh, and I haven't had any particular trauma around religion. Uh, I like being an atheist, and I've never been particularly tempted by, uh, by the Bible or Jesus or anything like that. So... Uh, you might want so to have you ever been tempted? Out. Hmm. Sorry about sorry about that. Uh, have you ever been tempted to do the things that are attractive in the Bible, like loving your neighbor, loving your enemy, even well, though that's can, hard? You uh, can do that stuff without believing uh, that there is a God. Uh, I mean, there's nothing unique to the Bible uh, that. That may that precludes love if you don't follow the Bible. Uh, what do you mean by a? Uh, I know this not the origin. It's, it's not original, but it's actually. I, I strongly believe that the Bible has not necessarily in its translated many translated forms, but as far as the bunk and the elements of the original hermeneutical approach text, that's where you going to find that these are universal laws that yeah, are Yeah, but I, like I don't gravity. think you quite understand where I'm coming from. I don't care. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there are some good things in the Bible and there are some bad things in the Bible, and I think that it makes the most sense to evaluate the things that you hear uh, in, in context of what you understand about the world in general. And there's no more special reason to take the word of the Bible or to worry about whether the Bible is properly translated and says only good things than there is to, to try to overanalyze like uh, Lewis Carroll's Jabberwocky pro, uh, poem. Uh, you know what I mean? I don't give the Bible any special consideration. Well, I mean, is it like the atheist experience so I, I think that experiences are all about the meaning that you attach to things. You know, there's this 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 uh, ch separation between church and state we got, and then all of the money that is printed says, in God we trust, I think is probably one of the most important issues. Otherwise, this uh, radio station, I'm, I'm not sure where it would be, nor me, nor myself. Well... Uh, that stuff demonstrates that it has a stronger cultural foothold than a lot of things, but that doesn't make it correct. So what is God according to the Bible, Pastor? Say it again. <laughs> according to the, to the Bible, theologically speaking and hermeneutically speaking, what did you find out is the entity of God from your studies and all your work that you've been doing? Well, I mean, I, I really feel like um, that God is um, the, I guess I would say that God is the, the projection of human beings' uh, longings and desires and hopes and dreams and wishes, even fears, and um, that we, we take 
these aspirations that we have for ourselves and for our community and we've projected them largely onto this big screen of the universe. Um, it, it's also been, you know, God has also served a purpose in, <clears throat> I'm talking about the concept of God, has served a purpose sure. in, um, I think, explaining unexplainable phenomenon in history um, and mm -hmm. also keeping people in line. Like, uh, I think the, the idea of God and what God could do to you if you step out of line, the threat of punishment, those are the types of things that I think communities, human communities have often used to create order and structure in society and explain um, you know, scientific things that we didn't understand at that time. So, so I mean, God has a history uh, and how God For came sure. to be. And, and to me, this is one of the things that I think helped me the most um, in, in sort of just letting go of this concept of a divine being that actually exists um, aside from the fact that if you, have an, if you have an idea about a God that intervenes in the world and participates in our lives, uh, you know, aside from the fact that that actually never happens in any sort of predictable way uh, or, or discernible way, um, beyond that, the thing that makes the most sense to me is that, you know, in the beginning, we created God and uh, ascribed to, to God these qualities that we would like to have ourselves in a way. And I also think it was part of our fear of dying. I think people in general are afraid of dying. I'm, I don't want to die anytime soon. I, I doubt anybody here does either. So in a desire to live forever, I mean, we, we, you know, we have other mythology about living forever too, the fountain of youth and, and all kinds of, uh, you know, Peter Pan and Never Never Land and all these stories that we tell about how we can live forever. And I think you know, the God story is, is another one of those about how we can, if we do the right thing and follow the right path, we can live forever. And um, so I think the fear of death is a big motivation in how we've created gods and the need for God. So how does atheism solve that, being that we live in a country that has supposedly separated from the church? I'm not sure who was joined <laughs> with the church. Um, excuse killed, me, killed the, the country... Jesus. The 85% of the people in this country is Christian, and the vast majority of like political leaders and uh, and like business leaders claim to have some kind of Christianity. So, from my perspective, at least, the country certainly has not turned away from the church or God. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to separate, um, you know, the country from God when you hear political speech and. Um, and, you know, especially around election cycles, everybody's striving to be the best Christian, you know, at that moment. Uh, so... How do you be the best Christian? Well, to, to how, us... How can someone be the best Christian or the best atheist? Like, that is, is not a question like, for us to sort out. Because, again, we don't care. I, yeah, I mean, I think in the political you, realm, it just means claiming if something. If I gave so you a million dollars, I think you would care. Like, if, if I took care of all your cares, and, that was, and I was saying that was... I'm a Jabberwocky or I'm a Christian, and I did something that just changed your whole entire life. If you gave me a million dollars, I might be willing to fake it for you. But that is not the same <laughs> thing as, actu as actually accepting that the stuff Wait, you is believe is Wait, is there a million dollars? Is there really a million? Yeah, I don't know. Have you got this? <laughs> I, I wish. But, I mean, as far as, like, g giving you something that you absolutely desire. Like what? Uh, as far as... Uh, like, uh, like love, like, do you know, like agape I've, love, I've like giving, love. giving you, say that one more time. I've got love. I know what you mean. You've got it. I, right, I, right. I, I think I know what you mean. Like you're, you're talking about like, if, if I had eternal life, the key to eternal life, you'd want to know about mm -hmm. that. You'd, you'd want me to tell you about that. And, and I, I think the claim that Christians make is, is profound. And if it's true, Everybody should pay attention. Um, right. It's a pretty amazing claim. Um, it's just that there's no uh, there's no real evidence. Which, which particular? I'm, I'm sorry. Which, which particular claim do do uh, at least from your experience do Christians make? God exists. Because the, the, what's the question? That God which, exists. Which claim do Christians make? Oh, so many. Um, Lots of them. So yeah. many claims. I mean, I think. 
I mean, you're talking about love and peace and all of those things that Christians promise that when you, when you accept Jesus, you'll have peace in your life. And I mean, so many people that I've talked to, atheists that I've talked to, they had more peace after they gave up their faith and when they were Christians. I mean, I'm actually a person who's in, experienced an increase in peace and joy in my life as I've stopped trying to sort of manipulate my mind and the Bible to make pieces fit together that just don't fit together. I mean, that's exhausting, heavy work. And, um, and when you don't have to do that work anymore, when you can simply take the world as it exists in front of you and deal with it as it's happening in real time uh, without trying to layer on some kind of other explanation for why it's all here and where it's all going, uh, to me, I experienced a great deal of peace out of that. You seem to be living a life of Jesus. If you say so, <laughs> I, I don't. I, yeah, mean, I, I mean, Jesus would have been like, the, I mean, theologically and with the words and the language, uh, Jesus would have been one of those real atheists. Then, why the religious <laughs> church would put him to, okay. to death because they were. I mean, there is a skewed way of religion. There is an interesting <laughs> theological argument That's that fine. on the cross, Jesus <laughs> became an atheist, you know, where he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And, and, uh, and so Jesus sort of gives up on God, too. So maybe. We don't know. Right. Right, right. I, I do believe that Jesus is Lord, and I think that he, okay. I think that it, it lives inside of us as far as, as far as not the person, like the the, the yeah. different details that are political, well, I really believe then that those are like In that case, lines. you can you can uh, say you're an atheist all you want, but most of us atheists around here don't have any Lord, let alone Jesus. It, and I like it that way. I, what about gravity? What about money? What about all these things that control you on a daily basis? <laughs> I don't refer to those as Lord. <laughs> I, I don't they, worship they, gravity or give money to it or, or set aside time to pray to gravity, so no. <laughs> what do you give money to? And that, that's what I'm talking about, who is Lord? Food? What do you give money? Time. My family. Yeah. <laughs> family, yeah. Who do you serve? Right. There's just, who does anyway, your family serve? Who's on top of that? I got other people on the line, so. Uh, I'm I, sorry. It's been. Thank uh, you for not, not hanging up on yeah. me. You guys are awesome. That's cool. Keep it up. Keep up the good work. You are awesome, too, Philip. <laughs> Thank you. Rock See on. See ya. Peace. Uh, Gimme line three. <laughs> uh, hello, Joseph in Colorado Springs. How are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. I was asked to call into the show by somebody, actually. Okay. Um, and, the topic, and the topic I wanted to cover was objective morality. All right. Um, I talked to a lot of atheists, and um, I'm actually close friends with a lot of them. And I, I kind of wanted to know, um, how do you justify things without objective morality? And I'm not saying that you need, um, how do I say this? How do you justify things that you do as being moral without having a set of what to, to uh, of guidelines to call things moral? I'm going to let our guest go first again, <laughs> uh, unless you need unless you need some support. No, no, I'm you know I think <laughs> I'm it's, sure you've had to talk oh, about yeah. this a lot this year. This this comes up a lot. Um, I think that this desire for objective anything is um, an illusion. Uh, a desire for something that doesn't really exist. When I was um, when I was a pastor, people wanted to know about the the ideal church or the ideal behavior or the ideal way of praying or the ideal worship service or the whatever. They always were looking for this idealism, this sort of platonic purity that we could somehow access that if we could get to that um, you know that pristine. Uh, you know, if we, could, if we could find the perfect coffee mug, then we could fashion every other coffee mug after that coffee mug, and we would have the perfect coffee mug. And I just think none of that exists. Like, I don't think any of that is real. Um, I, I, I really feel like um, morality is the way that we have uh, together chosen to maximize uh, the experience of our lives and, the, and the, the, the life and experience of other people. Um, I think morality is what, uh, the way that we behave that helps the most people experience the most joy and, 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 
happiness in life. And um, when we inhibit other people's happiness uh, in ways that we could avoid doing that, to me that, that becomes a question of morality. Uh, let, let me add on to that for a minute. Um, I think that there are different ways that objectively could be used. And uh, I think a lot of morality is based around, like Ryan said, trying to maximize the happiness of people around us. And also, in a bigger sense, sort of getting along with each other as, as a large scale society. Um, and it, uh, morality is going to have to be about accomplishing the goal of living up to particular values that you have. Uh, the values could hypothetically be subjective in some way because they are relative to the people who have the values. Like for instance, um, if cows were to make the most moral society, then I think hamburgers would certainly be banned. Um, yeah. But given that we can agree on a certain set of uh, value judgments, and I think most of us can because there are a lot of things we value like living a long life, living a happy life, uh, not being in fear of dying or of losing all our stuff all the time, uh, finding love. Given that those are our objectives, um, there are objective ways to achieve those, just like, for instance, there are objective ways to achieve a healthy body. Like, right. if you eat good food and don't smoke and don't do a lot of other bad things that are bad for you, those are objectively ways to uh, incre increase your chances of survival. And similar to that, behaving in what we refer to as a moral fashion is a way of maximizing, like Ryan said, uh, you know, our, our happiness and, and good living. Mm. And there are, th there are ideas that the Bible presents as moral, which are actually counter to some of those objectives, and, and uh, people wind up arguing about how those things are really good for us, even if it's not obvious. And like I said to the first caller, it doesn't much matter to me that the Bible says a thing is true. You have to actually analyze whether it matches uh, what reality appears to be. But, uh, I want to ask a question. So, would you say a large, um, I guess, morality would depend on um, the society or the the group of people that you're that you're talking about? Like, um, like if um, well, I think we could all agree. Probably most of us would agree that you know, killing somebody or raping somebody or you know, hurting a child probably wouldn't be moral. But there are societies. Yeah, well, that's the, totally acceptable. In. Yeah, the Bible doesn't always agree with that either. Yeah, what I mean, mean, I think morality has evolved in the same way that people have evolved. Um, and what I meant before by uh, there not being this objective, so like big, with a capital O objective standard, is that I think morality is, is an open source project, right? It's, it's a wiki. You know, we're always working uh, geek after my own heart uh, yeah 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 we're, tr we're always working together in society this is what democracy is about right democracy is about all of us theoretically uh working together to decide what is the good life and how do we give the most people ideally all people yeah, access a, to that good life a society where most of the members agree that rape is a good idea might be great for potential rapists Maybe, maybe not. It's definitely, and it wouldn't last. It it's wouldn't last. definitely bad for, uh, for the rape victims. Right, and enough of that behavior and something would change. Like, I don't think, like, take murder, for example. If, you know, there was that stupid film that came out a few days ago where they, sus <laughs> like, suspend one. all the laws for... Okay. For for a day and, and everybody just goes around killing oh, everybody. Oh yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, yeah, right. which is just absurd. Got, like, like I don't Christian think Slater or something. Yeah. Like, somebody famous. And it was it was this idea like if we suspended all moral values for a day, what would people do? Um, would they just like go around randomly like just murdering people? And I I just think society wouldn't last. And the reason why we have moral standards, roughly speaking, uh, in society is because we've learned that this is the best way to live together. Um, killing people is not uh, productive to the flourishing of society, the advancement of our species. Uh, it just doesn't work. It's not practical. Now, 
Um, what I want to ask you is, I don't know if you guys got a heads up to this before you guys answered the call from me. Um, you're aware of what the uh, you're aware of what Calvinism teaches, right? Yes, yes. Calvinism. Calvinists yeah. believe that. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong here. Uh, it's predetermined whether you are going to heaven or hell or not. Uh, and you cannot change your ultimate fate, but you can demonstrate through your actions where you're ultimately uh, intended to go. Is that right? Uh, right. Pretty, pretty but good. I want to ask you, I do want to ask you a question. So if you believe, like, let's just say that all moral values were suspended for a day, you kind of hit on that and it made me think of something. So I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that people would do, would act out, would go and do those sort of things? Uh, do, I think some <laughs> people would. Yeah. I don't. I don't have any particular interest in raping anyone. Oh, Maybe someone that has a grudge against somebody would take it out if they knew there were no consequences. You know. Yeah. Some sometimes threat of punishment will keep people from doing bad things. Yeah. I mean, but here's the thing. I am for social consequences, and I'm for uh, societal decisions to punish bad actors. But I was going to say, but if, but if people would do that, doesn't that speak to the doctrine of total depravity? Of what? Total depravity? Total depravity. No, because I said some people would probably kill each other, but I think most people wouldn't. Even as a Christian, I didn't believe in total depravity. Well, I mean, it doesn't, I, have to be, it, doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be killing each other. It could, be, it could be, well, I can't do nothing, I can't get in trouble today, so I'm going to go steal from this store, or well, I'm going to go commit this crime, and that doesn't that, have to be murder. That would be great for the thief. That would be great for the thief. It would be really harmful for the store owner. And so I think, you know, when we're talking about immoral actions, we're talking about a zero-sum game or worse, where one person's gain is another person's loss and the society as a whole doesn't benefit. Even just the, like a theory of large numbers, it, it, it's not going to last. You know, I, 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 you know, I've had this question put to me too by some Christian podcasters this year, and they said, you know, they asked me, um, you know, don't, why would I do a year without God? Why not do a year without morality or a year without, uh, a year of running a, a child slave ring or something like that? And, and I said, because I don't want to. Like, I don't, I don't want to do those things. I don't want to hurt people. I've never have wanted to hurt anyone. I mean, well, there's been a few people I've wanted to hurt, but that's different. You might not. It's not just about hurting people. But I guarantee you, there are things. If, if let me ask you a question. If I could, um, this was posed to, and I don't want to take up too much airtime, whatever. But this was posed. I want you to think about this. This was posed by you know who Paul Washer is, correct? Paul. By what? Do you know who Paul Washer is or Matt Slick? Paul, I know Matt Slick. Yes, we've uh, talked to him a few times on the show. I don't think I know. He, yeah, he's a uh, so presuppositional I apologist. Oh yeah. I've probably listened to you guys for the last like couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Um, Have you? You might want to go back and hear the Matt Slick episodes because there were one where he talked to me and two where he talked to Matt. I think. Uh, yeah, I'll go back and hear them. But I was going to ask is, so I mean, I don't know if you guys have the idea or the uh, whatever the humans are. Not all of us are bad. Some of us are naturally good. But let me ask you a question. If I was able. Um, and this is the last question I ask because I don't want to take too much time, you guys. If I was able to take every thought that you guys have ever had, everything, like any thoughts you ever had, and post it up onto a big screen TV for everyone to see, would there not be a few of them that you thought maybe I should have thought that, or that's embarrassing, or that's against morality, or anything like that? Because I know for me, there's been plenty of stuff yeah. that I thought that I sure. would not want everyone to there, know. There would be some things that embarrass me and some things that I'm really proud of, just like everybody. Well, does, doesn't that say to you that, like, there's at least some element of immorality in everybody? Or, yeah. Or bad? So? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, we That's are... That's a long way from total depravity, though. We are all complicated creatures full of desires and impulses. Yeah, a lot of times we are selfish and would like to do things that benefit us if we can get away with them, but uh, that is what the morality question is, because uh, you know, the reason that this issue is so hotly debated by philosophers and theologians is because it's really complicated to 
set up a world where everyone can live as well as possible and not just have like one guy who's the emperor who gets everything and screws over everybody else. Okay. Well, I think you guys have pretty much answered everything I had for you. Thank Great. You. <laughs> nice talking right, to you, well, Joseph. Well, Take care. You guys have a good time. We'll go back to watching your show on the webcast now. <laughs> All right. Cool. See ya. Hey, guys, have a good day. Yeah, these buttons don't work at all today. Uh, hang up on three and pick up four, unless you would like to do an interlude and say anything else that's on your mind. <laughs> no, I mean, just that that comes up all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's two ways of talking about um, morality. I mean, I think sometimes we're people, I mean, I, don't, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about these words objective and subjective. I mean, the minute you admit that there's like a subjective morality, uh, you know, people want to sort of jump in there and, and say, oh, then it's just situational ethics. Like, right. whatever well, you want to do, you just do. Christians seem to have a very all-or-nothing mindset. And, and also, they sometimes play fast and loose with the meanings of things like objective and subjective. Because, yeah. uh, you know, they say, well, if everything... It, if anything about morality is subjective, then everybody can do whatever they want. You know, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Um, and there, really, there is middle ground that we have to deal with and find all the time, right? I mean, we're working it out. I mean, isn't that what, I mean, to me, that's what democracy is about. We're, mm -hmm. we're working out how to be successful human beings not just alone, but in societies, in groups of human beings. And, you know, I can't just do whatever's best for me or whatever I think might be best for me because there's somebody living next door to me who may have something else to say about that. And there's the person I earn my living from who has something to say about what I do with my time. And, you know, there's, we're all living in a complex web of relationships. And it's that web of relationships that helps us figure out how we, you know, if you're the last man on earth, then you can make up whatever you want, I suppose, but. Right, because as long as it's not hurting somebody else outside yourself, there is not a, that need for right. a moral system. Yeah. Okay, line four. Uh, hello, Bob in Florida? Hi. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how Good. are you? Doing well. Good. Well, I, uh, uh, First of all, I want to tell you guys, I, I love your show. Thanks. And uh, Matt and Jeff, I especially appreciate Jeff and his, uh, <laughs> Sorry, and his rant. Because I love it when people call in to praise he, other people on the show. <laughs> no, but, uh, I just want That's to mention awesome. a lot of people ask on a regular basis, where has Jeff been? And uh, I, I feel like I can't answer this often en enough. Uh, he has taken an indefinite leave from the show uh, to have more time to himself. But uh, I mentioned the nonprofits at the beginning of every episode, and he is on pretty much every episode of the nonprofits. So if you are not subscribed to that podcast, do it today. Oh. <laughs> Good. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to share with you my experience. I was, uh, from an early age, I was uh, exposed to Christian science, mm -hmm. and I was I, I went to and there, after a while uh, exposed to that. I, I thought they were as far away from science as you can get. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, when I decided that I was going to become a doctor, they attacked me. And said, "No, you can't do that because it's not it's not the right thing to do." And that's when I first got the inclination that this was bullshit. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, I I walked yeah, I away just from that. I mean um, I want to make a point about uh, something the previous caller said, which is that here is an example where 
uh, people believe things for religious reasons, but it's actually harmful. I mean, people do Absolutely. people do die because they have Christian science beliefs and will not be allowed to go to a medical professional. A and Absolutely. it or isn't take their kids to a medical. Yeah, professional. that's I mean, even that's, worse because they're not making the decision. And it's an indisputable fact that medical technology has greatly increased the lifespan and quality of life of people around the world. Um, and so even if you did believe that there was an objective morality, don't delegate that to religion, because they right. certainly haven't got it. No. And, and, and so I, I went ahead and uh, went into pre-med, and then I discovered after a while that I uh didn't have the passion for it hmm. and, and but i had to discover that and in fact uh, i had taken a job in a hospital and and to, to try and see if i really was uh molded for this and what happened was uh, that I ran into, uh, uh, while I was working in the hospital, I ran into a member of the Christian Science Church who was in the hospital, and I said, well, what are you doing here? He says, oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but I, I did eventually drop out of pre-med, and I have always said that uh, there are a lot of people walking around today alive because I dropped out of pre-med. <laughs> okay. But, but in, and, it's and kind of subverted hand, the point I was making earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but, but the other point I was trying to make is that my brother has, has become this born-again Christian. It just drives me crazy. And finally I said to him, I have a better idea. Why don't you grow up? And and he just hung up on me. Huh, that's surprising. And and, and the whole <laughs> thing is that, that I have a suspicion uh, and I if he ever listens to this program I know him, that he is got gay tendencies and he's had them for years. <laughs> and, that means, but. and and the reason he has latched on to this religious crap is because he's afraid of going to hell. Okay. And <laughs> and and I, I I just feel sorry for it. Yep. Well we're sorry too. And and uh, it, it anyway, oh one other thing. Uh, my my granddaughter. Okay. This is the last thing. Then we got to move on. All right. Uh, my granddaughter uh, was it was explained to her recently what the uh, the whole thing about Jesus and the virgin birth and the whole nonsense was explained to her in detail, and she looked at me and she says, "Are you gotta be kidding?" <laughs> That's very cute. So, How old I is she? Very good. Hope. For her. How old? How old is All she? right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bye. <laughs> that uh, always reminds me of the South Park episode about <laughs> Mormonism, <laughs> where, <laughs> where at the end of the whole story, Kyle is like, so you actually all hear this story and you're still Mormons? <laughs> well, I mean, and here's the, here's the thing about religion that I think is... This caller, yeah. I think... Uh, line four is gone. Hang up before it's got a dial tone. Go on. Uh, yeah, I think the, the this this caller sort of, I think, lifts up something interesting about the way religious beliefs operate in people's lives in that they... There is a kind of self-deception going on with a lot of people. Like, they'll say they believe things that they don't actually believe. And the way that you know they don't actually believe them is that they act in ways that are contrary to those beliefs. And they don't, they, they pick and choose in ways that they don't even admit that they're picking and choosing. And so, you know, people like a Christian scientist who goes to the doctor and they're like, well, you know, I don't really believe <laughs> that. I, I, if I'm going to die, I'm going to go to the hospital. So 
I mean, I think people have their beliefs and then those beliefs bump up against real life and real life experiences and, and uh, somehow our minds have the ability to compartmentalize between these things. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, so line two, Dustin in Las Vegas. Hey guys, what's going on? Pretty, uh, not much. Let's How are you? you? <laughs> I'm good. Um, so uh, I wanted to call in. Uh, I, um, I'm in a relationship with uh, a in-the-closet atheist, and I'm an atheist as well. Um, my, uh, this more relates to like my own personal experience with her parents and sort of, uh, uh, well, she goes to church with her parents in order to kind of, you know, make them happy and um, uh, just kind of, you know, because she lives under their roof and if they were to find out, she would ultimately be kicked out. Um, How old is she? Uh, she is 20 and I'm 21. Okay. Um, so I was invited a couple times and I, for like uh, a board game night and I a campfire to their church and some of the stuff that I was hearing, um, you know, was sort of like in favor of creationism and, you know, being gay is a choice and um, just sort of like these bigot things. And I just, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to respond, but I kind of kept quiet and, um, um, my question is, like, how, how do you deal with those types of situations? Because, um, I mean, I, you know, it's, I, I feel like I have, like, a responsibility to say something, but at the same time, I can't, you know, cause a, a fuss. But, I don't know, what, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> You're looking at me, so uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'll jump in later. You, you, okay. go, you go first. Um, you've got a really complicated situation here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let, let me see if I can outline all the different relationships. I mean, first of all, you are basically an open and intellectually honest atheist from what I'm hearing, right? Right. And, and it is uncomfortable for you to lie about uh, or disguise your points of view. Right. Um, but you've, I'm guessing you haven't said anything to her parents yet. Well, I think they are under the impression that I'm an atheist and, mm -hmm. uh, um, the, I mean, See, normally <clears throat> my advice to people, and this is terrible advice because again, I am coming from a background of a loving atheist family. Um, right. But, uh, my usual advice for people who are old enough to stand on their own is that you should stand up for what you believe and be an out atheist because it helps all the other atheists out there. Yeah. But we also advise people generally don't do things that are risky and dangerous to your uh, well-being, whether it's your, you know, financial survival or your uh -huh. actual survival if you're getting kicked out and being made homeless, which can happen to people. Right. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. your, so your girlfriend is fine being tied to a situation where uh, she has to stay closeted, and yeah. you're fine being an open atheist, but then the two of you have some sort of an obligation to make each other happy while you're together. And you uh -huh. can't be upfront about what you think without uh, threatening your girlfriend's uh, uh, living situation. Yeah, that's exactly uh, oh. the situation. <laughs> um, so, yeah. If, it's, I don't sorry, know. I mean, your, your choices are to... Um, I, I mean, I guess I'm not being that helpful, but I'm just going to outline that the possibilities are you avoid her parents completely. Well, that's not really an option because she lives with them. Mm -hmm. uh, right. 
uh, al although, you know, you could say, I'm not going to spend time with you while you're at your parents' place. You can come to my place or we can go out to dinner or whatever, uh, but I can't have that burden. Or uh, you can hang around them and hide your beliefs, or mm -hmm. you can hang around them and be upfront about your beliefs, which could lead to some fighting. Right. And... Yeah. Uh, like, I, I feel like dealing with family is not the time to get in these deep philosophical arguments because that, uh, cover, because that makes your interpersonal relationships problematic. So yeah, when it sure. comes to my in-laws, for instance, I just at some point set some boundaries and said, look, I have really good reasons for being an atheist, but I'm not going to discuss them with you anymore. Right. That's that's kind of the route that I, I've taken because I'm I'm like you that mm -hmm. I was, you know, raised in like a in an atheistic background. Uh, I was never religious, so um I guess maybe it this situation is just uh it's hard for me to relate to people who have been uh in churches and, you know, in that sort of environment. So it, I guess uh me being open is not um, the best, you know, yeah. option. So, I mean, um, to, to me, it's it's also like you know, it, it, it's it's just, it's uncomfortable for me, sort of like it would be uncomfortable sitting around while a group of my acquaintances are making racist jokes, and yeah. and I'm just like, mm, you know, like I I can't uh -huh. not say something. I'm like, guys, that's not cool. Like, why are you you know why are you making those jokes? Um, yeah. And I so I think t to me. There's no good long-term way to hide who you are. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we, you probably agree with me that sooner or later it's going to come out that the girlfriend is an atheist, right? Yeah, and yeah. she needs to do that in her own way and in her own time yeah, with her family. Yeah, you can't family. really force it. But she also has to maintain her relationship with her family. And if you're in a long-term relationship with her, they're your family too, in a way. Right. So you're going to have to continually be in their presence. And I, I always think it, it really depends... Like who's going to be the the more mature person here? And unfortunately, it probably is going to have to be you. And they they might come after you about things or try to witness to you. And to me, mm -hmm. I mean, when my family does that, I just have to sort of politely smile and say, you know, thanks, Grandma, for praying for me. Because I she says I'm going to pray for you, and what I hear is I love you, right? Yeah. And and that's I think that's the way I I, I hear it. She praying for me because she cares about me and she loves me, if I allow myself to interpret that in a, in a really harsh way, she doesn't, first of all, she doesn't mean it that way. She really genuinely cares about me. And so mm -hmm. I'm always translating what my family is saying to me into, into language that I, I, that I think communicates what they mean rather than what they're actually saying. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think she's going to have to come out eventually uh, to her folks when she feels like she doesn't have to live with them financially right. when she has the freedom to either you know, live with you or well, live somewhere also, else. Also, I'd amend what you said about how they're ultimately your family too, and the the uh, actual reality can can be uh, you know only to the extent that she wants them to be, because yeah. there are some people who just make a clean break from their family That's and true. decide once they've moved out. You know, these people haven't really got a lot to offer me, and it's stressful to be around them. I mean, that's but not ideal. Like people her want decision. to make. I mean, I think people in general want to have a relationship with their families. I mean, that's, you know, you're yeah. sort of stuck with them. Like, they're, they're your blood. And, if, you know, if all things being equal, we'd like to be in relationship with our families. So that would be the ideal outcome, is that they could learn to accept where she's at. And I, a lot of times, fam I, I've talked to um, gay and lesbian um, people, Christians, about this too. They're afraid to come out to their family. They're afraid they'll be disowned by their family. And uh -huh. by and large, their family is like shocked, disappointed, sad, but ultimately says, I love you no matter what, and we'll get through this, which may not yeah. be the answer that you're looking for. You probably, the person would be looking for an answer more like, oh, that's great. No big deal. You know, I wish you'd told us sooner. Uh -huh. um, you know, that's not always the answer you're going to get. But a lot of times <laughs> families surprise their kids. You know, the kids yeah. think it's going to be this horrible thing. And. And the mom will say, oh, I already knew that, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, that's what I think, too. And I think that it might not be as bad as it seems. Yeah, and probably not. I, yeah, that's maybe. what I 
I try and uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna wish you luck and move it along. Uh, okay. But you know, uh, drop us an email and let us know if anything happens. For sure. Okay. All right. All right thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Uh, we're gonna add, we're gonna take our last call, and that is line four, Bernard in Canada. Bernard. Bernard, can you hear us? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, how's it going? Good. That's good. That's good. Uh, uh, I should warn you, we have like three minutes left till the end of the show, and I'm sorry for taking you so late. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. That's all good. That's all good. I always have a question for uh, Ryan Bell. Mm -hmm. um, I was listening to the show, and uh, uh, right at the beginning, he was saying something about he has atheist arguments, or you know, you, like when he went from Christian to atheism. And I would be really interested, interested in what the atheist argument actually is. For the, the God doesn't exist? Uh, well, okay, yeah, sure, sure. Therefore, no God argument. Yeah, I'd love to hear that one. I mean, I mean, there are a variety of ways to go at that. The one I think I was talking about at the top of the show was probably um, more like the anthropological argument that, um, that human societies have invented gods throughout its, our history. And, and you're, you're certain that God was invented? Or you're just certain that some gods were invented, and then you just assume all of them were. No, I'm not certain of much of anything, actually. Okay, so you're oh, so you're okay, so you're not certain for your atheist argument. No, no, oh, okay. I'm. I, I think no, that the having, evidence points having to having an argument does not imply absolute certainty. I mean, there I don't are know scientific any, arguments that come up all the time that support things. I don't know any atheists that are certain beyond a shadow of a doubt. Oh that no, I, I I don't either. I don't. I, I've only met agnostic atheists, but. Right. I'm just wondering, so you, but you said you, when you went from Christian to atheism, you said you had atheist arguments, right? That's what you said. And then your atheist arguments Reasons. are, like, do you have any arguments that end up with therefore no God? Like, but then you say no. So what was your argument, actually? Or what was your, why, why what convinced you that atheism is true? Um, I think it was more like I ran out of reasons why Christianity was true. Um, oh, okay, so you just kind of fell back into atheism is what you're saying. I mean, I think it's a kind of default position, sure. Like, I think that um, we as human beings tend to uh, sort of stake our lives on things we can <coughs> observe and test and know with some reasonable amount of surety. And um, I, I think I was, what I did was I realized that Christianity was the canvas that I was given as a child. And I was told, you can paint on this canvas. <laughs> And I did that for a while, and then I, I, I realized that there's a wider world out there. There's more, to, there's more uh, a bigger picture to, to see, not just the one I was given. Yep. And, and the uh, I'm sorry, we're be... out of time. We're going to have to put you on hold while uh, the credits are up. And uh, that's our show. Uh, you can stay on the line. We'll talk to you a little more after the show. But anyway, right, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, we are going to head for El Arroyo, and thanks, Ryan Bell. You've been a great guest. Thanks for having me.